Hello, everybody, and greetings. I'm Michael Romita, the President and CEO of the Westchester County Association, the leading economic development and business advocacy group for the Lower Hudson Valley. Much of what we have been doing during the pandemic is helping our regional businesses with the blocking and tackling, how to deal with grant and loan programs, CARES Act relief, temporary programs offered at the county level, and innovative solutions to whether the, sh to whether the short term liquidity issues created by COVID-19. Well, today we're gonna to take a step back and focus on the broader stuff. What businesses need to know about the macro economy, how to prepare for what may be coming, and how the banks and investment industry professionals serving our region can help. To that end, we have brought together for you today the leaders of some of the key players in our financial industry. But first, I wanna thank our platinum sponsors who are scrolling on the screen. I also want to give a special thanks to our program sponsor today, Citroen Cooperman, and I'll introduce Steve Ronan, the principal and practice leader, to make some opening remarks. Steve, welcome. Thanks very much, Michael, and, and thanks uh, for having me today, um, and I'm excited to hear what the panel has to say uh, about the, the greater economy. Um, as in my role leading our consulting uh, and our outsourcing practices, we, we have been helping a lot of companies navigate the uh, unknown characteristics of the business cycle and the economy um, during COVID. And now that we've, we've sort of settled into something that's, that's slightly more uh, uh, knowable, uh, you know, helping them understand what comes next and what they need to be doing. And, and themes that we, we continue to see uh, include businesses that need to plan differently, uh, different financial forecasting, uh, and, and with many more potential scenarios in front of them, um, it, it has become more critical than ever. We've seen a real need for technology uh, in, in a more urgent way uh, than there was before, not only with businesses moving remote uh, and online and people needing to interact like we're interacting today, um, but also in the capabilities to get faster planning cycles, faster decision support, and more velocity on their customers facing processes. And, you know, all of that plays into the fact that the future looks different than it did before. Um, and it's still uncertain, as I'm sure we'll hear, uh, but there's uh, going to be fundamental changes that our clients uh, and, and businesses at large need to make to the way that they make decisions, to the way that they run their operations, to the way they staff, and ultimately the way uh, that they go to market and, and generate revenue and profitability. So for businesses in our community, uh, we feel that the, the best thing to do is, is to be you know, going to events like this, getting information from the great experts that we're gonna hear today, and also to, to take a look inward and assess your business. Um, and that's why we released our endurance assessment, uh, which is available on our website and is also gonna be sent out in the link today and um, why firms like ours and others that are in the community are, are offering new services to assess your business, to help you build the infrastructure, to manage it in a more effective, more um, iterative way going forward. Because um, as we all know, you know uh, velocity is important uh, and we want to uh, uh, move small, but move fast in, in this environment. Um, and uh, in the interest of that, understanding how to move in the, in the economy uh, and the marketplace that we're gonna hear about, uh, is really the whole key to it. Um, so, uh, Michael, thank you for having us. We're pleased to be the title sponsor for today, and I'd like to hand it back to you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for stepping in today. Now, this is going to be a moderated panel, and because for most of you, this is probably the 3,000th uh, Zoom presentation you've been on, you know how this works, there will be a moderated Q&A. Please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function on your Zoom screen to make it easier for our moderator to curate the questions. So at this point, I'm going to bring in Dr. Richard Highfield. Uh, Dr. Highfield is the interim dean of the Lapenta School of Business at my dad's alma mater, Iona College. And before Iona, Dr. Highfield was interim dean for Central Washington University and was dean and professor at the University of New Haven. Richard, welcome. Please join in and introduce our other panelists. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much, Michael. It's great to be here. I'm glad that there's at least a family connection there to Iona with you. Uh, what I'm gonna do first is briefly just go around the room and introduce who our panelists are. Many of them will be familiar to you because, well, they're, they're your bankers. 
Uh, my, the first is David Lewing, uh, who is market uh, president for KeyBank in the region. Welcome, David. Uh, next, I've got Mike Vitali. Uh, he's senior managing director and senior vice president at Sterling National Bank. Welcome, Mike. Uh, I've got Joe Roberto. Uh, Joe Roberto uh, is, is president uh, and CEO of uh, PCSB Bank. Uh, welcome, welcome, Joe. Uh, and my fourth panelist is Frank Michalisi, uh, Regional President for M&T Bank. Welcome, Frank. Uh, we're, I'm going to have all of the panelists in a second uh, uh, talk for a couple of minutes. Uh, what I'm going to say just by way of introduction for uh, my institution is that uh, I am, you might see my virtual background here. My virtual background is a really nice virtual background. It's the, it's the uh, atrium of our brand new La Penta Business School building. And at the time that we uh, had the ribbon cutting for this building last January, uh, there was all that optimism uh, that Bill was talking about. Uh, we were thrown out of here in March, uh, and we finally got back with students in August. So it's wonderful to be back. I'm hoping sometime in the future, I can uh, host a Westchester County Association event uh, here because I'd like to show it out. This is a virtual background because if I was out in the actual atrium right now, I'd have to wear a mask on like the students who are out there right now are, are, are wearing. Uh, what I'll say about uh, Iona in general is we believe in, our, our phrase is learn outside the lines. In other words, it's not just what's on, this, on the syllabus, it's it's, it's what's going on in the community, what's going on in life. Uh, so I'm, I really hope I have some students attending this uh, event because we're, we're talking to uh, regional uh, people leading the, 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 the banking community in the region. And we'll be hearing from people who use banking services right now. It's not the textbook. We're talking about a real situation. Uh, that's exactly what we like to bring to our students. So we'll begin uh, by asking uh, each of our participants to uh, give me a little sense of what's going on from your institution's perspective right now. Just a couple of minutes uh, for what's going on from your institution. We're going to begin with uh, David. Uh, David? Thank you, Richard. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, unfortunately, my, my background is not virtual. Yeah, I'm in the office and, uh, uh, and we're, we're trying to get back uh, and I'm one of the, the vanguard, I guess. So most of the people won't be coming back. Uh, I, I run uh, middle market and uh, my role is market president for Key Bank for the Hudson Valley Metro New York area. Uh, Key Bank, as many of you know, is about $150 billion bank with origins in Albany uh, that focuses on the true middle market. Um, my, my role encompasses businesses such as our retail business, the branches, the business banking area, middle market, private banking in this tri-state area, and our corporate investment banking area, a very, um, I think, robust offering. Um, I, I, I just want to mention, I, I think where I'd start is to talk about, I mean, how we have been helping uh, our clients and, and the communities through this pandemic that we are also familiar with here. We have, for our consumer customers, been you know, providing financial assistance and relief to our clients experiencing economic hardship. Uh, we've, uh, we've been giving them payment deferrals, fee deferrals, penalty waivers. Uh, we've waived negative account balances, all of the things that you would hope and expect uh, of your friendly banker. Um, we have also been uh, cashing checks uh, on the government issued stimulus program. Uh, Key Bank is the state of New York's key to, uh, key to benefits debit card vendor. So uh, it's been a big, a, big, uh, a big effort and one we're proud of is, is doing that. For our business customers, uh, we, we, at this point, we, we, were at, we ended up being about the seventh largest bank in the country with respect to PPP lending. We process more than 40,000 SBA paycheck protection program loans, uh, totaling about $8.5 billion. A good, Again, a big effort we were proud to be a part of. Uh, we definitely put, gave it kind of the all hands on deck uh, effort. 90% of that, I think we're proud to say, went to, to small businesses. Approximately 24% of them are in the low, uh, low to moderate income areas, uh, which I think was the true target of the program. Um, we're an approved lender for the Federal Reserve's Main Street Lending Program, and we've been active in that for those that are interested to hear more. 
Uh, Key for Women, you know, provides customized financing and networking and educational resources to women in the tri-state area. And, and we are also providing help through our, our, our wellness, financial wellness programs here. So that, that's what we're doing uh, for our clients. For the, for the community, we have provided, you know, a million dollars in emergency COVID relief uh, across all of our markets, um, including this market. Uh, we've repositioned a lot of our planned spending, you know, uh, to COVID related programs, including the United Way of Westchester. Uh, and, uh, and we've also uh, provided, uh, you know, about, uh, gosh, $175,000 uh, through not-for-profits in the area. And, uh, and, uh, and importantly, about 50,000 to the local, um, uh, local change agents for social injustice and, uh, and racial equity uh, through the uh, NCAA, ACP and, and urban leagues. Um, so, so, so that's what we're doing locally. Um, I'll shift briefly to, I think, the topic that was mentioned at hand, the PPV forgiveness program. And being such a big part of that, uh, where we are now with respect to forgiveness, which may be on the small business owner's mind, is that we have launched our portal. Uh, we are handling our applications for forgiveness in waves over the course of the next two months. Uh, I believe we all need to get this tied up by the end of the year. Things change, but you know that's, that's what we are, have, have structured ourselves for now. Um, so, so that's something that I think, if you got your PPP loan through, through us, you will be hearing from us shortly if you haven't already. Um, I will mention that uh, yeah, it has been a complicated process and there are changes, but I do feel for those that are concerned, you know, any loans under two, any loans under two million are probably going to go pretty smoothly, you know, if you, if you paper it up correctly. And I know Congress is considering um, an act to, uh, to give basically blanket forgiveness to loans under $150,000. So that comes through, that'll, that'll alleviate a lot of the burden on terms of the processing uh, that, that, that we may bear, that you may uh, bear as a, as a business owner and we bear as a bank. So uh, keep it, we'll keep an eye on that as this, as this continues to play out over the next little while. Um, uh, with respect to the Main Street program, I'll just mention real quickly that um, it is not obviously, a, it, it's not a grant. This is something that um, you know, involves each bank's ability to assess the credit worthiness. I think the government relies on us to do that. As a, uh, you, 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 some, of our, some of our inquiries are, are, are feeling entitled to, to, to the six times EBITDA you know, a, a leverage that the program allows and things of this sort. I would just mention that I think each bank looks at it differently, but we are certainly applying the same credit lens as we had with an eye towards carving out, obviously, the behavior of the last couple months and, and, the, and the downstream. So we're in business in that program. Uh, we're active and, uh, um, you know, a very, very important uh, part of what we're trying to do uh, to keep, keep things uh, going here. Uh, with respect, shifting briefly, and, and I'll, I'll tie it up shortly, the, the economic outlook as we see it may be helpful. Uh, we, we conduct a quarterly business sentiment survey through our middle bar, uh, to our middle market business executives, primarily C CFOs from businesses ranging from, gosh, uh, 10 million of revenue up to 2 billion of revenue. It gauges the impact of the current macroeconomic environment. And you've heard most of this from Bill, but you know our, our recent survey uh, tend to confirm, you know, what, what what others are saying, and that is that, um, you know, that that, there, that optimism is trending upward. Business owners, you know, continue to be wary of the economics of uh, the nation's health, but. Businesses that are impacted by COVID have, have not worsened since the second quarter. I think compared to late March when we saw the shutdowns to combat COVID, you know, the outlooks have shifted. 51% uh, of owners stated that they were very positive or somewhat positive about their performance today versus less than 40%, you know, a couple of months ago. Negative perceptions have improved, you know, uh, to 30, you know, 26% as opposed to 37%. So it's about a quarter, a quarter of the responders are still, you know, concerned. Um, you know, 70% of the impact on their businesses has been, there, has been either as expected or maybe better. And we all know it's been a little bit of a tale of two cities for those companies that may have benefited in the short term versus those that are hit hard. Uh, the good news is in all the things we've done to help people, all of the requests, many of the requests for relief have diminished. You know, we, we're, we're in a better position than we were uh, most significantly. Um, so, uh, you know, half the half of the businesses who have made changes, furloughs, et cetera, are, are, are somewhat or are, are fully operating again. Maybe they haven't brought everyone back. Uh, you know, you know, many may not bring those employees back. Um, the uh, the pandemic has made the mergers and acquisitions business uh, a little murkier. It's very difficult to to really predict what's happening uh, as this thing uh, as the trough continues with our recovery here. 
So, so what does this mean? Well, most of the companies seem to be weathering the economic impact for the remainder of this year. Uh, the recovery will be tied to, to the public health, to, to the vaccine, and it will require continued cooperation from the private sector. Um, and, and lastly, thinking of what business owners and executives might want to be focused on over the next couple of months. I think, um, you know, during the pandemic, businesses were quite rightly uh, and necessarily focused on liquidity and, and stabilizing their operations amidst the shutdowns that were no fault of their own. Uh, loans and on lines of credit to shore up operations. Today, I think businesses need to focus on how they will grow their business in the next 12 months. Borrow for investment and, their both, both, and invest in both people, you know, as well as assets, and, and we're, we're looking to help that. Uh, PPP forgiveness, we talked about that. That should be on your mind. Um, you know, if this plays out correctly, you know, it's a grant. You know, you, the, the loan will be forgiven, uh, and issues regarding the accounting for that will be something that you obviously need to take up with your, your, your tax specialists, but, you know, could be uh, more favorable if that's the case for you, um, that your loan is actually forgiven. The other thing I'll mention is that are on people's minds is, is, is cybersecurity, you know, um, you know, in this environment, as we go more, more virtual, and everyone has basically embraced that, we have as well. Uh, and, and with respect to, with respect to the business owner and, and perhaps digitalizing his business doesn't mean he's, you know, he's, he's got a, whether he's got a Rust Belt business or, you know, a, a consumer business, digitizing in a sense that, you know, he might want, be wanting to automate his payments, automate the receivables and payables, uh, engage with fraud protection if you haven't already done this, things of this sort. Um, and then, uh, the other topics of, uh, uh, on top of people's minds will be the move to SOFR. We can talk more about that in the Q&A if you'd like to. We're, we're getting on top of uh, the secured overnight financing rate, which is replacing LIBOR. We're building it into our documents. And, and, and lastly, and, and Bill mentioned the, the economic uh, trends, which we, I would uh, agree with. I think it's, it's going to be an unusual recovery. You know, it was faster, at least in the, the equity markets, but narrower, narrower in scope. I think you saw maybe 50% of the, the stock market is, is in the, 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 issue, the companies there are probably still down year over year. Um, and 23% and, and of the, of the S&P and the increase we've seen there have been from, uh, are comprised of five companies. So there's, there's been this flight to quality. There's a lot of cash. The government stimulus has is, is, is left a lot of cash in your accounts with us and other banks, which has been good. And uh, you know, we'll continue to work through all this together. Thanks, thanks Richard. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and I think now we'll turn to uh, Mike Vitale to see what, uh, how this looks from the point of view of Sterling National Bank. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ifield. Um, first off, I, I do want to thank the WCA for asking me to speak here today. Uh, it's also an honor to be uh, speaking with the other panelists on here, some of the uh, most respected people in the, in the local uh, banking industry, a couple of which were, were mentors to me at the beginning of my career, so uh, excited to be here. Obviously, COVID has presented some unprecedented changes uh, here at Sterling National Bank. You know, first and foremost, um, with my colleagues, we've been really working 75, 85% of the bank has been working remotely for going on seven months now. There's some bumps and bruises at the beginning, uh, but happy to report that for the most part, you know, we've been, uh, we've been in pretty good shape moving um, most of our employees uh, to interact with our clients and do business virtually. Um, you know, looking back on uh, what a transition that was uh, at the end of March, it's really amazing when we were able to do that. Uh, so, you know, I have a perspective of dealing with a lot of business owners uh, directly. Uh, my role at the bank uh, is I run one of the, the Westchester-based sales teams for Sterling National Bank. Uh, I also have clients that I, that I was dealing with basically you know, on a daily and weekly basis, still doing so, but, you know, in the, the throes of the pandemic, uh, it certainly was uh, was more frequent than that. So I've really been able to kind of see on a personal level how things have, have kind of moved and changed. And, you know, what David uh, and Bill Keller said before, you know, really kind of has, has played out on, a, on a, a, a smaller personal scale as well. End of March, April, in the beginning of May, a lot of business owners really did not know where this was going. You know, it was a scary time professionally uh, and personally as well. You know, I don't think you know, human beings aren't great at dealing with exponential and seismic shifts, especially in the short term. You know, we're, we're much more used to dealing with change on a linear basis. And this, this was not linear. This was exponential. And, you know, that, that's hard to run a business when you don't know what's going to happen next week. So kind of dealing with that was, was obviously very challenging. Now that things are on a little bit more of a level playing field, I think it's a lot easier for, for businesses to kind of feel what's happening and what's going on. So uh, we've certainly seen, you know, confidence return. Uh, we're nowhere near out of the woods yet. Um, you know, there's, there's still a lot of, a lot of issues as, as everybody's kind of raised, but we are 
this month's better than the last month and, you know, better than two, and, and that month's better than two months ago. So we are starting to see things, you know, recover. In terms of what Sterling is, has done, um, you know, in the community, you know, I know PPP is going to be a, a pretty popular topic. Sterling originated about 3,000 PPP loans. Uh, we funded about uh, 600 to 650 million. Uh, we are starting the forgiveness process as well. Our portal is, is now open, um, just like I'm sure the, the rest of the banks uh, that are here. Uh, so we're starting to process those uh, those applications. Um, you know, we went through the, the round of, you know, making sure clients, uh, you know, got the support that they needed uh, in terms of services and waiving fees and, you know, making sure we modified payments where appropriate. Um, we went through that as well. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. We, you know, and Bill said this before, Sterling came into this year, into 2020, and, and really in a very aggressive growth mode. January, February, we saw that that play out. It was a very, very good economic you know, situation. Um, and we, in those months, really executed on a, on a pretty aggressive growth strategy. Obviously, the pandemic had significant impacts on that. We had to be much more internally focused. But now as things have recovered, you know, we certainly are, you know, open for business and, and looking to, to, again, expand, you know, expand our brand. So, so the bank is, is certainly open. Um, one of the things I, I'll kind of, kind of add, uh, again, what, you know, Bill was talking about the millennial generation. I'm, I'm happy to, happy to say that I am part of that generation. Um, and one thing that I could, um, potentially say to business owners is that I do think this is potentially, um, a, a life changing shift in how things are done. Um, people moving in different places and consumer preferences changing significantly. Um, that's happened in the short term, but I certainly do you know, see that that potentially happening in the long term as well. So, you know, doing it the same way we always did is not going to work anymore. Um, I mean, it might in some certain circumstances, but overall, I think that that's a, that's a good kind of overall lesson to kind of, you know, take into account is the world has, has certainly changed and it's going to continue to change. But in, in terms of how we see kind of the world from a COVID standpoint, things have certainly recovered and we're nowhere near, near out of the woods yet, but it's, it's a lot better than it was in the past. So, Hopefully we can continue to get there together. And uh, you know, I, I, one other thing I'll say, uh, it's been inspiring to see what this business community has done. You know, over the last three, four, five months, going from something that was, you know, horrendously frightening uh, to recovering that quickly, uh, it was kind of inspiring to see. So, well, thank you very much, uh, Mike. I think uh, that the last note of inf inspiration is tremendous, uh, but there's an awful lot of uncertainty out there, as we can see. Uh, is that the way it looks to you, Joe, uh, at, at uh, PCSV? Thank you, Richard. You know, I, I do. I do see some positive signs. Uh, and I, can, I see that through talk, talking with our customers. Uh, as you know, um, we talked about it earlier. Banks you know, had to uh, embrace the PPP lending program and certainly understanding how important that was for the livelihoods of the, the businesses, especially the small businesses in our community. You know, I've been in banking for 45 years, which means I'm old, number one, but I've also been able to uh, go through many cycles of the economy. And I've been a banker in Hudson Valley for, for, for all that time. And certainly, you know, we saw the recession, great recession and financial crisis back in 2005. And nobody saw this coming with regards to the pandemic. Nobody signed up for that. And so it was just dropped on our doorstep and we had to deal with it. And I think the bankers on the most part have really stepped up and understood how important it was for their communities and making sure that uh, everyone's livelihoods would still be able to continue businesses still will be able to thrive. Uh, and I think um, people, you know, did say, let me talk to my banker. I think that's the, the main message for all businesses out there. Keep the lines of communication open with your banker because they want to listen. They want you to succeed. You want to succeed. The banker wants you to succeed. The last thing we want to see is you not to. So, we will work with you. So keep those lines of communication open. Um, I will say that um, a reason for my optimism is that banks, besides funding for the PPP program, also looked at loan payment deferrals, which was a big part of uh, getting the small businesses back on their feet. 
no modifications, there were fee waivers, we've all embraced that. Uh, and I do see the initial uh, loan payment deferrals uh, coming to an end, and I see businesses back to paying their loans. So that gives me a sense of optimism that things are getting better. Obviously, the unknown is, um, you know, what the winter is going to bring. And certainly, um, if we're going to fall back a little bit, we don't know that. Uh, but what I say to business owners, understand your cash flow, understand how much money you need to run your business. That will determine what you can and can't do. Uh, understand where your, what your cash needs are determine where your sources of cash are from. Do not wait until you need it. The last thing to do is wait until you need cash. It becomes more expensive when you do that. But um, I will say though that I'm, I'm sure the other panelists will also talk about their staff and their employees and how they had to adapt to a working environment that was different than anything they've been used to before. Uh, the other panels talked on working remotely. Uh, it, it, it's something new to a lot of people, but as a business, we've embraced it. And, and it seems as if that's something that will continue on a, on a regular basis going forward. But I will give credit to my staff for um, what they've had to do to, not, to educate customers to embrace electronic banking. Yeah. Uh, there is a segment of electronic banking, whether it's technology challenged or I'll say the older customer base that have not embraced it. But I tell you, our, our staff ha has uh, made sure that they worked their, these customers through the process of electronic banking. And now they embrace it. And they ask the question, why didn't I do this before? So I think... Uh, yeah, that's so it, it's become a, a process for everybody on the panel to, to go through. And I will say, as um, I know Mike did, you know, we have a, a PCSB foundation uh, which supports nonprofits in the area. And understanding that it's difficult for nonprofits to, to raise money during this crisis, events uh, have been canceled, not being able to be held. So, we're supportive to the nonprofits through our foundation uh, because they are so important for the community and what they provide for the community. So I do see a little bit of optimism moving forward only because of what I talked about earlier, as I see people uh, being able to come out of deferrals and, and start making the payments. And uh, uh, as you see, unemployment dropping. So I think. Hopefully, it's not a, going to be a quick recovery. It's still going to be a long recovery, but I think we're getting there. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, Frank, you get to end up in a little bit of a speed round, and then we're probably going to go right into our uh, uh, Q&A, and I promise to get the first question to you. Thank uh, you, Dr. Okay, thank so, you. Uh, this is Frank Michalisi. Yeah, thank you very much. And I certainly will be brief and I wanna compliment my colleagues for just addressing a lot of things that I had checked off as you guys spoke. So I can certainly be very brief. I, I do just wanna say that, you know, I've been in the industry about 40 years and just to see the collaboration and see everybody put the competitive nature aside and seeing the banks rally together and using that platform to help each other with the PPP loans, with the with the CARES Act and all of that. I, I was very encouraged in an industry that certainly gets its fair share of blame. It was nice to see everybody rally together. And I just want to compliment uh, you know, my colleagues that are on the phone to see the industry come together, especially in Westchester County. I think I would just say that... Um, um, you know, we've learned a lot about ourselves in the last several months. So, you know, we saw how resilient and how adaptable our, our clients are and our employees. And it was interesting to see how, you know, a lot of our clients have pushed us to communicate in different ways. And I think it's been a challenge for us to figure out how do you want to communicate with the bank? What's your comfort level? Is it face to face? Is it electronic? We have seen a lot of electronic uptick in mobile apps and, and electronic platforms. And, and there's certainly a role for that. And, and, and now even more so. Um, well, one thing I would just say is that I, I use this phrase a lot, and hopefully people can appreciate it. Bad things do happen to good people. 
And I think the one thing I've been saying to folks, and be it our clients, be it our employees, be it the the the, the law, the lawyers and, and accountants, is that just have transparent, honest conversations with your bank. No one likes surprises. Bring us in early. Let's sit down. Let's figure it out. Look at your projections. Look at your cash burns. Where is the pain and how can we help? And in, in many, many, many cases, we're able to do that. And I was really proud of our bankers for doing that at m and um, and specifically in Westchester County, which we have a great book of business. Um, so we were able to put back together, you know, deferral programs and, and everybody talked about. We did two, 935 uh, PPP loans just in Westchester, $255 million. Our charitable organization, I am very proud of, I chair that. And in Westchester, we gave over $250,000 just in Westchester. Many of those organizations, not-for-profits that are COVID and uh, social injustice kind of charters. So I'm going to stop there, doctor, because I know that uh, we're short on time, but uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for participating this afternoon. Well, thank you very much. I know we'll go right into questions right now. Uh, and I know uh, Bill Keller is, is still here, and we, so we can also have questions that have to do with, with his portion of the program. But as I promised, I'm going to throw the, uh, the first question back, back to you, Frank, and that is, what is what is your greatest concern from the bank of, banking industry perspective? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, doctor. And, and I think you just don't know, right? I mean, that's the uncertainty and the anxiety around something that's uncertain. You know, we've had this conversation, I'm sure you guys have as well, even with family members and colleagues and business owners, is that if you knew you were striving for a point in time that the world would be better, then you can strive for that. And we're wired to solve for that. I think the uncertainty has caused a lot of concerns in the fact that there are no direct answers. There are clients that actually have done very well in this environment, you know, that in industry-wise, medical, supermarkets, box stores, they're, they're, but there are a lot that are hurting. And I think that's where it's been difficult is for us to take that journey, understand what resonates with people and what the conclusion is going to look like to be successful. So to me, it's just really the uncertainty, but you have to have trust. And the only thing I would say is just go to your banker, go to your professionals and just have an honest dialogue. And believe me, a lot of times that comes off a lot better than you would anticipate. Well, thank you very much. Well, if anyone else wants to weigh in on that, uh, the, the big concerns, uh, Joe, what, what would your, be the biggest one from your perspective? Biggest concern for the banking industry. Well, I, I think, uh, it is still the the unknown of uh, what the winter is going to bring, and, and, and certainly if there's a regression back to where we were in, in, in March and April, that's the biggest concern. But I think it, it, if we do seem to regress back to where we were before, we're prepared for it more than we yeah. were before. As I said before, nobody signed up for this, so it's not you didn't make up things along the way, but you adapted along the way to what you had to do. So I think as bankers, we are better prepared for a second round if it comes during the winter. Well, that's great. Uh, next question is, actually, I, I happen to know it's coming from a finance professor, and it's not me, uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this to David because I think you brought it up. Uh, what is what is the stage of our preparation in changing from LIBOR to SOFR? You know, what, yeah. where are we in that? Good question. I think the, the first the first thing to understand is it's definitely going to happen. It's going to happen in, in, in about 14, 15 months. Uh, and uh, everybody is finally taking it serious. I think the, pre the precursor to really getting serious about that, we took kind of a fast follower stance to answer the question. We were not, you know, the banks that have the leading flows are the ones that are taking the lead on this, they're getting the most scrutiny. First, you've got to have you've got to have activity to be able to, you've got to have funds flow, people using this rate in order to create the infrastructure to create, you know, the market uh, behavior around this. So that's happening now more than it has in the past. But to, but, but to be, so I, I think we're on the track, on that track. I think, you know, we'd like to see more activity. So, but, but, to the, but the last thing I'll say is with respect to the, um, the borrower, to the bank, to the, uh, the, the business borrower, uh, you know, it is something that is very is something you're going to have to understand to the extent that you are a, a business that has, is able to borrow under LIBOR today, uh, it will go away and you will need to be able to, you will be borrowing under SOFR uh, at least, you know, at the, by the end of 2000, beginning of 2022. Uh, and it's not the end of the world. 
I think it will actually be a more secure rate. It'll be less susceptible to volatility. And I do believe that, um, and, and rule of thumb, don't quote me, rule of thumb, you know, the rate's probably going to settle in around 15 basis points lower what, than what the equivalent LIBOR is today, if you want to figure that in. But banks will make sure, you know, that, 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 that the economics of the, of, the, of the borrowing arrangement you have will be preserved, both for you and for us. Uh, thank you very much. I think we're getting very near the end, but I just have one last question. And I'm going to throw it to Mike as the admitted uh, millennial of the, of, of the group. And that is, how confident are you? Um, so, I mean, you know, in, in the short term, uh, you know, I, I think that there's still, there's still some pain. Um, yeah. In the long term, you know, I certainly believe that, you know, people in general figure it out. Um, you know, and, and as somebody, you know, that has, you know, hopefully two, three decades kind of left in this business, you know, I, I certainly believe that, that the business community and the banking community will, will kind of figure out whatever the new normal becomes, yep. um, which could be, like I said, you know, d drastically different, or it could look pretty close to what it was before. I, I think that still kind of remains to be seen. Um, you know, there's certainly, there's certainly pain for, you know, for banks coming. Um, I, I don't think there's any, there's any doubt about that. There's pain for businesses coming, but from a long term, you know, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of smart people in this world, and they're going to figure out what the environment's going to be, and whatever that environment's going to be, we'll all adjust to it, and that'll be you know that that'll be the case. So, uh, I don't think the system's kind of going anywhere because of one virus. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of the panelists. Uh, I'd like to invite you all to come here and lecture and finance at Iona at some point. Uh, I'm a cash flow guy. Loved what you said about <laughs> cash flow, Joe. <laughs> I know what it is, um, but it was a great pants. I'm a lot of optimism in the room, a lot of caring for customers in the room, a lot of caring for uh, em employees as well. I think that's all great, and it gives me an awful lot of confidence for the future. So I think now I turn it back to uh, Michael Ramita. Thanks, Doc. Um, I got a couple of questions through on the chat function that I'm going to filter okay. through to the panel as well. And, and one of them was, um, you know, the, the access to capital, liquidity out there for, for organizations and, and businesses that are looking for capital, other than the government programs that came through the CARES Act. And David, why don't we bring you back into the conversation? Are banks lending out there? Yeah, good question. Valid question. Um, you know, the, the, the question was, earlier about my biggest concern. My biggest concern, quite frankly, is, is a second wave or a third wave. Not because, you know, for the obvious reasons, but I guess it's because it, it says a lot more about the way that we are responding as a population to this thing, because we have the ability to control it. So, uh, you know, and, and that, that speaks to the uncertainty that we were speaking about earlier that banks have to contend with. And, and it makes it very difficult for us if we can't get, uh, if we can't sense the comfort, the predictability that our clients uh, you know, have what there's uh, the feeling around the uh, co confidence around their business and what it looks like. It's going to be very. It's going to be difficult for us. Uh, we'll be there. We'll be there for them. Uh, the, the one thing. I, the other thing I will mention is that um, you know the banks are stocked with liquidity, right? All this money, as I mentioned earlier, is in people's bank in their bank accounts with us. We have lots of liquidity. Unfortunately, on the, on the other side of the scale, I don't. Ha I haven't seen the regulators relent in terms of their asset quality capital adequacy requirements. So we still have to make, you know, keep adequate, adequate enough capital on hand to, to ensure confident uh, movements in the markets. And uh, that, and what we've been doing, just to be, uh, uh, perhaps provide a little bit of insight, is, is, is looking at regrading our portfolio based on the performance of the companies that we have right now. And, and that trend has not been an upward trend. That trend has been a downward trend. We, we think it's stabilizing. We hope it's stabilizing. But, um, and, and, but the, the punchline is that um, if, 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 unless it gets much worse, you know, we are now we are now reserving more capital against the loans that we have to you as, as business borrowers, but we've got plenty of capital to, to lend. It's all about getting comfortable with, um, you know, you, you and I, you and us together, getting comfortable with your business prospects, and we'll be there. Well, that's a great that's a great answer. Here's one for for Joe at PCSB. As a business owner, you know, one of the things that might be paramount from my perspective is is cash flow. But, but from, from your perspective, what are the things that executives should be focused on between now and just getting through the next two quarters? Well, I, I think, again, cash flow, again, is important for them to focus on. We know that. Um, but if, 
if you believe that you're going to need working capital for your business over the next few months, make sure you secure your options for that cap, that working capital and have a plan in place in the event that you, you, you do need it. And, and, and I think, of course, uh, it's adapting to the environment that you're going to be able to operate in. Just no different than the way banks had operate in a COVID environment, businesses should also focus on how they're going to continue to operate in a COVID environment. And that's what people do. People do adapt. People do change. So I will do say that I do see that uh, the business owners will look at the future and say, okay, I can continue my business, whether it's a restaurant, uh, whether it's just a, a, a retail store, but I'll figure out a way to work in a different environment. And I think that's what business owners should be focusing in on right now. Where are you gonna get your cash flow? Where are you gonna get your capital? And how am I gonna operate in the future? Which we know is going to be different. One last question, and we'll throw this out to Frank. It looks like we've got a whole panel of George Bailey's on the phone. This relationship style banking, which is really your banker as a community partner. Uh, we can't see each other face to face these days and have that tactile, tangible connection. We're working in a virtual world. Uh, how has that changed the function of the banker and keeping those strong relationships? Yeah, it hasn't been easy, Michael. And that's a very good question. I think, you know, part of it was how do people want to be communicated with? And I think a lot of people still are old school, if you will. They want face to face. They want to be able to look people in the eye and they want to understand that there's trust that's being developed. And so, you know, for us, it's been basically, you know, just communicating in a form that they're comfortable with. But we have face to face calls. We are going on calls. We're being very, you know, socially conscious as far as, you know, reducing the risks. Um, but I, I think that the, the question about the owners you, you brought up is an interesting one. I, I think when we're, talk, talk, when we're talking to people, we're just saying control the controllables, the things that you can control. When you look at your P&L, you look at your balance sheet, you look at technology, and then sensitize things. How, how, what if, ask yourself, what if? What if that doesn't happen? What happens next? And I think, as David said, too, the banks are flush with cash. But I think the conversation is also saying it shouldn't also be on the backs of the bank and the government. What, are, what is the equity owner doing? What are they doing in, in, in contributing to this situation? And I think when you have an honest dialogue, dialogue like that, you come out with a really good conclusion for everybody, Michael. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. The intellectual rigor of the discussion today is a constant reminder of why I went to law school rather than <laughs> business school. And, and appreciate that very much. Um, before I thank the panelists, the, the overarching theme that I come away with is people are struggling right now. Um, unemployment in, in the lower Hudson Valley is around 13%. There are sectors of the economy that have been hit incredibly hard, hospitality, uh, retail, uh, food service, et cetera. But it seems like everybody in the call is relatively optimistic. And that actually mirrors some uh, survey work that has been done at the Westchester County Association uh, in a business survey that we put out a couple of months back that received over 450 responses from, from business owners and, and workers. Uh, overwhelmingly, people were optimistic about the future of Westchester County. And only 10% of respondents out of over 450 respondents were actually pessimistic. And it also showed the wisdom of the markets that the majority of respondents also felt that the economy would bounce back in two to three years. And that seems to be what the panelists today seem to be indicating. So that is very encouraging news if we can just get through the next couple of quarters and struggle. And we do have some control over it. We can take personal responsibility. We can wear our masks and we can maintain the kind of social distancing that'll help the economy bounce back as quickly as possible. So I wanna thank uh, Dr. Highfield for moderating today from, from Iona, my dad's out Mata Go Gales. And I want to thank our fantastic panelists, David Lewing from KeyBank, Mike Vitale from Sterling National Bank, Joe Roberto from PCSB, and Frank Michelisi from m and Bank. And a thank you to all of uh, all of the people who tuned in for this fantastic panel discussion today. Stay healthy and stay safe, everybody. Thank you.
And there are platinum sponsors. Excellent. 